So then John is like a pizza pie, you know, pizza slice, right? So when he comes in, he says actually what he says. He says, I have a problem, which basically means that there is a part of me who is causing a problem. Now, what I would like for you to understand now is very, very simple. This part, which is causing the problem, it's not the part who is complaining about the problem. Okay? It's like a culprit. He would not go to police and denounce himself, right? So there is this part who comes into your office and says, I have a problem. So from a perspective of parts, the, the, way to, the easiest way to understand how parts work, just keep this in mind. Every time somebody complains about a problem, there is a part of them complaining about another part of them. If you get that into your head and say, it's not John who has a problem. There is a part of John who has a problem, or maybe several, but at least this guy, this part, says, um, I don't know. Give me a, give me an example of a problem. Let's see. You write it in the chat. What kind of problems do you normally work with? I'm just curious. Let's see what um, what problems would we be able to work with? Let's see here. Write it in the chat. Biting nails. All right. Good, Betsy. Anybody else? Let's see who else gives us some more information. So biting nails says Betsy. Smoking says Gary Hicks. Bad attitude. Anxiety. Awesome. All right. So I know you guys are alive. That's great. Okay, good. So now this part comes in and says, I want to stop smoking. I want to stop biting my nails. Uh, I uh, have a phobia. I, uh, you know, have a bad attitude when it comes to X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth. Right. So when the client says that, I automatically know there is a part or parts, it could be more than just one, who is causing this problem for this client. I, I actually have found in, in, in 30 years of working with people with pain problems that all, you, you clearly, okay, you have to understand the medical aspects of a person's presentation and their pain. So you have to do some research and you have to do a good intake and you need to talk to the medical providers. But what I found is that hypnosis is, is effective for every kind of pain, but it's not effective for every kind of pain patient. What determines whether or not hypnosis is effective with a person who presents for pain relief is that person's personality and the kind of rapport that you develop with that client or patient and how you introduce the concept of hypnosis. But all types of pain respond to hypnosis. It's the patient and the rapport you develop and how you frame it. We have a, we have a, um, a correlation between, between level of psychological distress and experience of pain. There, we, we also know that there's a correlation between level of psychological distress and, and um, physical problems. But what the, what the research is telling us at the moment is that we've definitely got that one between emotional distress and perception of pain. So basically, interestingly, they're both measured on a scale from zero to 10, which is kind of unusual in the first place because also, different things are measured on different scales. It just so happens that these two are measured on the same scale and it just so happens that they turn out to be correlated and they turn out to be causal. So we've got a situation where, for example, we might have a level of psychological distress that's a 6 out of 10 where, and we might have a level of perception of pain that is also a 6 out of 10. But they move like a seesaw. So one can go up while the other one goes down, yeah? So if we've got somebody who is coping okay emotionally, then their level of perception of pain actually goes up and the other way around. And that's been shown to be causal. Um, I'm waiting for the research, or maybe I've missed it, <laughs> that, that that actually 
also applies for um, not necessarily pain itself, but also physical conditions. The other thing is that there's some new research that's just come out in the past few weeks from um, Melbourne University that actually shows through imaging that what happens when there's a stress response from the limbic system, which is that threat center in the brain, when the adrenaline hits the brain, immediately immune cells stop dead in their tracks. Fascinating. I mean, we always knew there was a, a link between, between stress and immunology. Now what this research shows us is why. When the person is in a crisis situation, he's always in a trance state. He's emotionally high and he's very focused and um, in, in internalize his emotion or focus on one thing. This is the rainbow period we always use um, to get uh, to uh, focus and direct the attention at the emotion from negative uh, uh, aspect to a positive aspect. So I will say everybody in a crisis situation, they are in trance state. That's ah, well okay. said. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about you when you're being faced with a gun or a riot. I'm sure you've seen riots in Hong Kong because of all this political hoo-ha that's going on in Hong Kong. Um, how do you temper your reactions? Okay, that's a very good question. Okay, um, uh, self-care and also self-hypnosis is very important. Okay, when we go um, to any operation, Okay, we always gather my team. I always gather my team together. Uh, we all quiet ourselves. Okay, do a self hypnosis. Okay, just imagine the um, good outcome of the situation. And I will stop, uh, practice uh, some uh, breathing, uh, some uh, mindfulness breathing, and all this. So, um, so, and also we trust our training, we trust the teamwork. We trust the um, skills that we learn and all this. So this is a very big experience. That's why I always say um, I, we got three very good weapon, teamwork, okay, stress management uh, skills, and also our activism skills. All of these things ultimately are to make you feel good, to get you to believe, to get you to take the action because Nothing happens without action, um, but we're not going to act unless we get ourselves to believe. So it really, it starts with these words, you know, starting with what it is that we, uh, that we, we don't want, turning that into what we do want, and then ultimately uh, creating the powerful statements around that, the powerful images around that, all of that causing us to, uh, to believe in what it is that we want to achieve and the belief is going to send you into action and the action is going to create the results. Any questions? But those techniques work great. The almond technique works great um, when you're working with, and especially in the induction, because it's a non, no nonsense um, approach. It's one where they go like, all right, I get this. I, I understand what you're doing with the direct methods, direct suggestions, the, um, uh, types of things that Dave did all fit into their category. They, they would probably go nuts um, with uh, Eric's, um, just a guess. So um, now the second part, uh, be alert, be alert for the, uh, what they're like in the um, uh, suicidal aspects and stuff like that. And be direct. Okay, well, that's, that's the Elman part. Be direct, okay? So be direct with them. And they'll be direct with you. And you're going to hear things that, you know, you might not want to hear. Like my story, if you heard the full story, you know, hey, you probably want to sweep it. Um, so you got to be direct. And, you know, be there. How do you get there to work with these people? And I was reviewing uh, this book, which some of you may be a little bit familiar with here. And I just found a paragraph that kind of, I, I wanted to read this. I didn't find this till this morning. But it tells you a little bit about how times have changed. And that's a good thing. Change is good, right? If you're a hypnotist, hopefully you think change is good. And how time changes some things that we that we uh, reevaluate and change, 
and modify. And then other things that it's nice to go back and grab and realize, you know, some basic things really form the core of what we do. And this is a paragraph that includes some things that will, I think, depict both of those types of change. And here's the paragraph. It's out of the introduction to this book. I have been teaching hypnosis to medical men for years and have found that many of them seem to think they can become expert hypnotists after a few classroom and practice sessions. Since they, there really is no such thing as a hypnotist, this is obviously impossible. As a practitioner employing this tool, all you can ever do is to show a patient how to go over the hurdle from a normal waking or sleeping state into the peculiar state of mind known as hypnosis. You won't hypnotize him. He will hypnotize himself. This means that those of us using suggestion wield no power over any subject. It means that there is nothing to do that I do that you can't learn to do in hypnosis. And I read that and I was going over this book again, like I said, the last few days. And I thought that's, it's got a lot of inf interesting things in there, a lot of truths and a lot of things that we would probably wear differently today. And that's good. That means we're always evolving. When I do know what I'm doing in the Elman induction, what I've done today is change the language from uh, a directive language, which was Elman's day, that was what that was worked on. You do this, you do that, you do, and 50% of the people weren't going into hypnosis. Yes, you see the people in the 50s, the culture was different. Internet wasn't around, nothing was around. People would really be in awe of the doctors and the dentists that took the Elman thing. So when they were, they would just accept it. But things have changed vastly of that. People check the internet for what their doctor has given them a diagnosis of. Uh, it's just continuous. So I changed the language to meet the needs. And that is, I made them allow to go to them, and allow them to close their eyes, choose to close their eyes, do whatever, but use allowing language. So the Elman induction became 99% proof, and everyone went into hypnosis. He was focused on talking about, you need to make sure that the, the clients, the end subject, he says patient, but we don't call them patients these days, or not here anyway. And... Uh, for for me it's about making sure that you don't have any fear you don't have any worry the other way to put it that is really to have the intent again his comment in his book was i don't know if i could help that patient but i was certainly willing and again that to me drives real intent you know this stuff works and if something's new in terms of a clan or even just in terms of someone you've never met before and you don't know how they're going to respond I know I can do this stuff. And I know it can work. And I, the completion of that sentence at that time was, well, I was certain willing to try. And well, we maybe don't emphasize too much on the willing to try these times. We're willing to do it. Yes. But uh, I find that amusing when I went back over that statement. And again, don't expect to have perfect results from the start. And the second quote, if you have excellent results in your first few tries, you're nonetheless bound to find failure later on so well he says set this up for failure maybe but again as i explained the first you know even with family even with friends it was working perfectly but after a while you know i came across instances where it didn't work the way i expected it to even though i was doing it cut paste maybe it was just getting too lazy getting too set in, in my way of processing things and that experience that doing it over and again and practicing and practicing and practicing really gets you to stay on your on your game because we're all here because we love and appreciate all so we want to just get to know who dave elman was well he had a niche yeah in page uh 15 in his book he talks about how he uh his first student was an oral surgeon that's what they called dentists in those days <laughs> an oral surgeon who took him uh to who went to see how uh, Dave worked and he was so impressed that he said I want you to come on courses to see how we dentists are taught 
yes, dentists were taught in the, the old days to, to do hypnosis. Even my husband, who was a, um, a GP, a doctor, went on a two-day hypnosis course back in 1972, and I still have his original copy of the Heartland book. So Dave says, I, I'm going to quote him, I wanted to know what I knew that they didn't know, okay? And it was, so, the training was so bad. He was so unimpressed by what he saw that uh, he decided to put his own course together. So you can read about that on page 15 onwards. And yes, his niche then was working with dentists and doctors. And you can tell from his book, he didn't pretend to be the expert, but he also worked with doctors and dentists to learn from them. Yeah, and it's so unlike Ericsson because Ericsson actually never taught what he did. People observed him, wrote down their interpretation of what they saw and observed, but he never actually taught. You know, and that's the difference with Elman. He did actually work up at the coal face, if you like, working with clients, doing demonstrations and answering the, the questions of the doctors and dentists. And uh, he walked the talk. So if you're going to get a niche, you need to walk your talk, <laughs> not just talk your talk. And he, he tells us on page 36 and 37 that he had six gingiv gingival cav cav cavities prepared and filled with uh, auto-suggestion, which we now know as self-hypnosis. Yeah. He also um, taught uh, dentists to apply hypnosis and... He, his rapid inductions, um, he, he took from stage hypnosis, which is what Nicole was talking about, how you can learn a lot from stage hypnosis. He took rapid and instant techniques into dentists and doctors because, and that's what I do when I do a lot of demonstrations for dentists and doctors. If I can't hypnotize someone faster than they can get an injection numbing their face, then they're not interested. Some people would say, but why would I teach self-hypnosis? Because it's a bad money model. Um, well, clients aren't going to come for as many sessions if they can do it for themselves. However, you could counter that with the argument that if you teach your clients self-hypnosis, they're learning to become a better hypnotic subject, which means that they're going to get better outcomes stronger outcomes they're going to learn a life skill as well and that then means wonderfully that they to think more of you they may refer more people to you because they had a stronger outcome they'll think of you if anything else comes up because you're the one that actually helped them evolve so self-hypnosis can be quite useful for a model for hypnotherapy and so when working with this ms uh, patient that I was working with, one of the different uh, parts that we ended up looking at through hypnosis is that whole notion of ID, that internal dialogue. How do you really see yourself? How does it affect your identity? For this individual, there was a strong feeling, as is for many people, a feeling of brokenness, a feeling of damage, and with that sense of damage, that person felt unattractive. They felt they weren't going to be able to find partnership. It also affected purpose and competence. These are core elements in our psyches of how we relate to ourselves in the world. Hypnosis was helpful to discover that and then to create empowerment to actually rebuild those core concepts of how we experience ourselves. So... A lot of what we do looks at beliefs, values, fears, resources, the self-ID, doubts, and negative patterns. These, this is the domain and realm of clinical hypnotherapy. This is where we shine to help people to empower those, to help heal it. And, and I do believe it is a healing process. The other element, uh, and then I'll close on this part uh, and come back in, is that I believe we have to be careful, as Patty has referenced, scope of practice. In other words, I never pledge and promise that I'm going to uh, remove or create an alternative. That's why I don't like that alternative idea to conventional me medicine. 
I believe that it's a partnership. Now, are there times where we work with people and their pain issues and their symptomatology improve? Yes. I've had people come in where they, in particular, uh, a person uh, several years ago who came in because they, they were going to have knee surgery and they came in limping into the room. They sat right in that couch. And as they sat down, I said, my goodness, you look like you're in a lot of, a lot of pain. And it was like, yeah, well, would you like to work on that discomfort? Yeah, that'd be great. So we did a hypnotic induction, used some calibration, some future pacing, and that literally, when they finished, they stood up and they went like that on the same knee. And I said, oh, what, what's happening? They said, it doesn't hurt. I said, my goodness, that's marvelous. They went back, they still had the surgery, but with so much more ease, they didn't feel as anxious about it. They actually, their healing time was very pleasant. And they, the office of the physician called up my office and said, I don't know what you did, but can you send me more cards? So my sense is that we work with the whole person and people come in oftentimes not about that. They come in with some other interests. They may come in with targeted interests that are specifically medical hypnotherapy based, but it's our ability to see where hypnosis can target change in healing and growth. Is scope of practice. It's just really worth bearing in mind when you're dealing with sleep, that sleep deprivation can manifest on this arc of everything from, gosh, I feel really kind of tired today and pretty lousy all the way into um, hallucinations. So we can go from, from there, you know, kind of arc through questionable judgment and being accident prone all the way into the really uh, potentially psychotic episodes. So I'm just going to take this little moment to recognize that if you are specializing in sleep, that you might get some of those calls from people that really do need a referral and they really need some screening. So that's a part of my pro practice is to screen those people who are using hypnosis as their last resort and they're completely desperate or they're, they're really needing some medical help. And of course, I'm sure you know better than to advise people to change their medication. I just had a client uh, last week who said, so I should stop taking my pain, my, not my pain, I should stop taking my sleeping pills tonight, right? And I said, nope. <laughs> and, um, and so working with their providers obviously is important. And then just one little sort of sidebar to this issue of scope of practice is that one of the more common sleep complaints that I, that I hear about is uh, a pattern of going to sleep pretty easily and then waking up three or four hours later. And this can be a signal from the body that something's going on that actually needs some attention medically. And so, um, you know, for my clients, this has turned out to be anything from endocrine issues to food sensitivity and a lot of different things along the way, some of them pretty serious. And when clients are coming to me with this pattern, I will just suggest that they would, I would suggest that they have a physical or check in with their doctor to rule out a medical issues. In using hypnosis, we have to give more focus working with the patients on the perception more than the verbal guide. I'm not guiding him. I just asking him to bring the sensation. For example, if he's lying in the bed, for example, what do you feel in your spine in this moment? Do you feel more pressure on the right side or on the left side? Do not change, please. Just bring your focus, your attention on the sensation of your body against the body. Then if you want now, to raise one leg. Don't, I don't want you to raise the leg. I just want you to think about, if you have to raise one leg, what should you do first? Which part of your spine should press more against the bed? Should you press the same, the left or the right, or maybe more the left, if you wanna raise the left leg or more the right leg. In reality, I don't care about the answer. I just care for him to go back and look in his memory all the patterns, all the software movement that he had already, just to find a new way to build new connection. Learning, motor learning is motor control. Nothing less, nothing more. He has to learn again to control his body, right? And he has to focus on what he's doing very deeply without being in a hurry. He has to bring his attention, what will move his body in performing the exercise. So doing different things, always new 
movement proposal. Respect his limits. Never challenge a stroke patient. It's very dangerous to challenge them, especially in the acute phase or subacute phases. In my country, they can stay one month in the acute department of the hospital. They, they stay three months in the intensive rehabilitation care. Then on the full month, they're sending home. And that's terrible because after four months, they have no physio anymore, at least if they don't have enough money to pay, right? That's why in statistic, you see that after one year, uh, improvement is not so easy to get. This is not true. It's not a matter of time. It's a matter of rehabilitation. If he has a lot of money to pay the rehabilitation and the physio to go home and do the exercise, at least in my country, they will improve. And we have a lot of statistics on this. So there's this thing I've been talking to clients about called sliding. And what it is, is that when we have a heightened emotion, when we're triggered, we seem to slide into almost like a different personality. And this personality might have a different voice. It might look down at the ground. It might, um, you know, this personality might like to have a glass of whiskey at night time to feel good or might need to eat. Um, so when we're triggered, it seems that um, we have a, so say when someone's anxious, their personality might be a lot different around their mother-in-law, say when they're at home comfortable. And so we have these different personalities inside of us and I call it sliding. So when we get triggered, we slide into a different person and you guys will notice that in yourselves and other people. So when we have a client in the clinic and the heightened emotion comes up, basically they've slid into that other personality that we want to work with. And so we have got an amazing ability to work, work um, really well with that heightened emotion because we're tapping into the, basically our response when we slide is that of the age where we first got triggered. So you might see a really strong man who's normally at home, goes around a mother-in-law and suddenly you see this little boy with his head down and he's talking quietly and it's like, yes, mum, you know, this kind of personality because when we're triggered, our brain switches back to that little child that's being hurt in that moment. And so our responses, our actions, our behaviors are that of that child. So when you uh, say you've got a husband or a wife, I should say husband and wife, you know, when you are maybe having a little bit of an argument and they get triggered, have a look in their eyes and ask yourself, how old are they right in that moment? And how would you treat that age? Would you yell? to a little five-year-old boy that's getting upset? Or would you actually say, hey, hun, that's actually okay? And I know that's really hard to do when we're arguing, but is that gonna create change? Because if the brain is fired up and triggered back at that age, at that moment, you see it in real trauma cases where you know, someone's getting really um, fired up and suddenly they're sucking their thumb. I've seen it in an emergency room. They revert back to a little child because their brain believes they're at that freeze moment and that they're unsafe. So say if you are doing behaviours like eat, eating sometimes when you're feeling insecure, that's just a little child part of you that felt safe by eating. And so, of course, when we clear that freeze response, that, that response in the body, that implicit memory, and chuck it back in the past, of course the client's behaviours are going to change because that little child doesn't exist anymore. That little child that was needing to eat for comfort, that feeling... Um, that trauma response of needing food isn't there anymore. 